Welcome in everybody. Uh, I'm going to show you today just the basics behind the Russ EFI UA EFI onboard wideband controller. Um, just bear with me. I've got a lot to go through here, but we'll try to show you in the most simplistic way how this thing works and how to set it up. So the very first thing that you need to do with this is you need to wire it in. Um, I have just the board with a 3D printed case. So my situation is a little bit different. Most of the time there are Molex connectors that you can buy that go around the edges and this wouldn't be something that you would need to solder in. However, I, um, I did solder it in um, on mine and I just want to show you, let me get something to point with here. This area right here on the board is the onboard uh, CAN bus connected wideband controller. So let me pull it up real quick. I've got the documentation um, that I pulled from the GitHub repository right here. This is actually uh, one of the schematics for the board. And you can see this thing is kind of just sitting off on its own and it is connected over CAN bus. So your CAN high and low goes, connects to the bus on the main controller here. And this is, that's it right there. So the way it talks to the UAEFI is over CAN. So you have, that's like part of all the settings that we have set up. The next thing is getting this thing wired correctly. You gotta be careful, this has 12 volts to it. You can burn it up if you wire it incorrectly. So on the LSU 4.9, that's the uh, connector style and the, the uh, plug that we're gonna be connecting to, it has numbers on it um, for each of the six connections in the back of it. I don't know if you can see down in there very well, but there are six pins and all of those have a pin number. So right here, um, I'll highlight them. These are the six pins on the back of the LSU 4.9 and they correspond to the UA EFI pins on section E. So right over here is section E. I broke that out here on the diagram so you can see it a little bit better. And the, the names on the board, these silk screened portions here, I put right next to the pin number. And then I just did like a, a little bit bigger description um, of what these typically are called in um, the LSU 4.9 documentation uh, that you'll find out there. Um, I've also got uh, the pins and the connectors. Uh, where I got this connector was from ProWire USA. They have it, uh, there's a bunch of other sellers. I think Bollinger Motorsports and like eBay, those kind of places, you're gonna be able to find this too. But keep in mind that the pin numbers on this, like one, two, three, four, five, six, do not match the one, two, three, four, five, six pins on here. Um, just make sure you get that right or else you could burn it up. Um, with that being said, uh, just make sure you get this wired up correctly. There's lots of good um, diagrams and I've tried to put as much in here so you can just pause the video and go from there. Um, and what we're gonna do now is, now that we have, we've shown you where this is and we've got it wired up, uh, you know, whatever way you're gonna do it, if you have your Molex connectors, you can make your own harness for that. We're gonna plug it into the sensor. Now this is a typical sensor for an LSU 4.9. Um, it is a Bosch uh, genuine part. And this is the part number. Sorry, let me back up the zoom here. Um, that's the part number. Uh, you can find these kind of anywhere. Um, check for a good deal. You can find them around. And uh, this one has a long lead on it. There's other ones. Uh, the Rust EFI documentation has like a few for like Kias or uh, a couple others that have shorter leads on them. But for my situation, I need the length. Um, so I got this one. This has like a pretty long lead that just comes with it. So what we want to do is we want to connect this. Um, we want to connect the UA EFI to the actual sensor and we're connected up, but it's not powered. And you'll notice right here, I have this adapter. This is an adapter that I made for going to Toyotas for the 5VZ FE. Uh, a lot of other Toyotas from the 90s and 2000s use this flange style. 
Um, I'll put it in the description. I have the files you guys can uh, laser cut these or uh, 3D print and then trace it and then drill it out yourself or whatever you want to do. Um, I'll just give that to you guys for free. That's a little bonus if you want to do that. That's what I have connected here. That's why it looks different. It's actually, it is an M18 1.5 thread on there. Also, this will get hot. So, um, you know, if you're setting it on a surface and you're testing it like this, just be careful. I've tested these a few times and we're only going to run it for a few minutes here. So, anyway, let me zoom back in. Um, these LEDs that you see here flashing, those are significant. And if you pull up the documentation for Rust EFI, it'll tell you what these um, flashing LEDs stand for. Um, we're, we're gonna set it up here in a minute and uh, these will become significant, but the very first thing we're gonna do is we're actually going to update the firmware for this controller. Since it's kind of its own device, it has a way to do that. So we're gonna jump over to Tuner Studio. Um, let me make sure I've got my power on here. would uh, get people if they weren't familiar. So we need to go to CAN bus, CAN settings, and we need to turn on the CAN bus read and CAN bus write. Um, we need to set those, and then we need to enable uh, Rust EFI CAN broadcast. Um, in fact, if you see in the documentation here, I think right here, yep, setting up in Tuner Studio, um, we need to make sure enable Rust EFI CAN broadcast is set to true and uh, enable can wideband under the EGO sensor is said to true. So um, yeah, technically you just need to have that one, but I'm just gonna turn them all on and uh, go ahead and burn this. That just sets those settings. And, and then we can go into can O2 sensors and we can set this to true. Um, another place, I'll pull these up side by side, is if you go under sensors and you go to um, O2 sensors right here. This is the uh, this is the same toggle. So enable can wideband set to true, and go ahead and burn that. And now we're set up in here. So yeah, just make sure you get the the CAN bus settings. Turn on the CAN bus so that it can read and write. Enable uh, the Rust EFI CAN broadcast, and then. Um, under the O2 sensor, we need to turn it on so that in the O2 sensor module, we're actually pulling it in over CAN. If you shut this off, you'll notice down here the analog stuff uh, becomes available. So if you want to set up analog, you can that way, but we're doing the in the onboard one that is CAN bus, so we're just going to stick with true there. And it wants us to uh, power cycle, so I'm just going to shut the power uh, supply off and we're gonna just pull this off, let it power down for a second, and then we're gonna plug it back in. And there we go. Turn it back on, power this guy back up. And you can actually hear the CAN bus module making noise now. Um, that is, uh, is normal. And let's go in real quick and I'll show you. Uh, when we go to sensors, Rust EFI onboard, uh, wideband, this right here, wideband controller, we're going to update the firmware. So uh, go ahead and just make sure that you have one connected and it, it is connected, it's on the board, and just go ahead and hit update firmware. You'll see right there the lights are going in alternating back and forth and then it goes back to a flashing green. So it has now updated the firmware on there. That's all it took. Um, and then these two index buttons, um, I checked with the guys on Discord about this and because the UAEFI only has one wideband controller, um, these are not necessary to press, but it does set the index to zero by default with just one controller. It's basically like if you have two controllers, uh, zero would be one of them and then uh, one would be the other. So. Yep, that's all you need to do, and uh, those are ready to go. Um, now we can go back to sensor, um, O2 sensor right here, and I'm gonna show you how to manually start this thing up because 
um, by default, um, the sensor heater, if you don't, um, if you don't change any of the defaults, it will only start up and warm up the sensor when the engine is running. That will keep the sensor lasting longer. Um, there's you, you only want this running essentially when the the engine is running. But for a test bench uh, purpose, we'll be just fine uh, testing that. And if you go to view on the right, you can go down to wideband state. And this actually pulls up like a little uh, logger here. And you can see in real time what the wideband controller is doing and getting feedback. It's pretty cool. So what we're going to do is we're going to go in and we're just going to turn it. Uh, we've got this set to on. And now we're going to force O2 sensor heating. So it should. Uh, go through and do the heating process and then it will stabilize and we'll get um, I think it is a green uh, green steady slow flash would be sensor uh, hot operating normally so that's what we're looking for all right so let's go ahead and do it so we're gonna ho go to yes and then burn right here you can see um, we've already got some stuff coming on the log and there's the heater duty cycle and it's kind of it's going to be hard but maybe at some point i can help you guys see down inside the sensor but you're going to see the sensor start to glow um, it kind of looks like a glow plug down in there but yeah you'll see this and yep now it's operating normally you can see that it has started to pick it up it's all the way lean because there's no uh, fuel um, going across it so it's just picking up air currently um, it's really kind of hard to see from the camera, but down inside it is glowing and it will get hot on you. Um, but you can see right here, it is ready and okay, heater is working, there's no failure. So we have successfully picked this up and it's, it's working well. Um, I have noticed when I was first testing this, uh, sometimes when you set everything um, on for the first time, if yeah, you may need to reboot it. Um, it was just kind of a, a circumstance where I had to reboot it once and then it it uh, kicked on and it was just fine. So if this doesn't work immediately, just reboot, you know, unplug, make sure this thing's unpowered with all the settings correct and then power back up. That's at least what I found. Uh, um, but anyway, and then we can just go ahead and hit no on this and we can shut off that heater. I can already feel it getting warm. Um, so that is powering up and running and there you go so you can monitor it you can turn it on and off it'll tell you the status and then um, as a bonus under fuel here you can go to uh, the closed loop fuel correction and then you can just set the enable to true and uh, you can run closed loop fuel correction now based on having this guy hooked up um, so Anyway, um, these are just some base settings that it came with. I just turned the time cons, um, uh, the time of uh, how fast it it makes changes. I turned it down. Uh, the lower the number in seconds, uh, the faster it iterates, and I just set it to five percent up and down. Uh, this works really well. I have uh, experimented with it a little bit, and it works awesome. I even kind of put it in a bad situation where I purposely made the fuel table bad, and then change these so they were like it allowed 20 percent of change and then went and checked it and it works really well so uh really impressed with this onboard can controller can is the best way to connect a wideband uh, then there's no voltage offset or uh, voltage drop when you're trying to set up an analog connection there's ways around that um, setting up sensor grounds and stuff like that but the can bus is just really nice and it's on board you have one right here that saves you quite a bit of money so uh just want to say thanks again to the rust efi guys for sending this out for me to test this has been a really fun experiment love playing with this thing it works incredibly well and i hope it works for you guys too so we'll see you in the next one thank you